want to thank uh, JR, Rup, Sarita for um, doing this. This is, you know, really, really exciting. Uh, as, as I had mentioned in, in a lot of places, JR had given a, a presentation in January. So excited to see where um, things have evolved. But basically, um, I'll be here if, if things are needed. Uh, otherwise, it's your show. Run, run with it as you please. Um, for attendees, if you can please put your questions and things in the Q&A, that way people can actually, you know, we can interact with them a lot more easily rather than if you put them in the chat, they can get lost very, very easily. And if you put them in the Q&A, then people can upload them as well. So people can see uh, what's going on. And sorry for the background noise. My dog has decided it's time to be very active. But, um, so I'll, I'll be here if, if uh, needed, but otherwise, you know, it is your show to run. Thank you all so much for doing this and, and uh, I'll let you take it away. Yep, thanks Scott, appreciate the opportunity. So we'll just kick off with some introductions. Um, and then after introductions, um, I'll spend about 10 minutes talking about what and why a data lake via data mesh architecture in the cloud and how JPMC is thinking about it. Um, I'll touch a little bit around uh, what is data product thinking, but Sarita is going to go into a lot more details on that journey and how we went about that journey, and we're still on that journey, so it's not to say we we, we arrived, and I think she'll give a, a great, a lot of good um, learnings from that. <clears throat> and then Arup will then go into uh, how we technically implemented um, and kind of our evolution and how we evolved in that thinking. Um, and we're still on that journey, uh, especially, you know, being one of the largest investment banks. We're very um, um, making sure we're being thoughtful how we do this to make sure we're um, <clears throat> not only being able to, to build a data mesh architecture, we're making sure from a, a, that we're building the most secure approach as we take this into the cloud and giving the engineer the autonomy to be able to do it. So. I'm James Reed, so I'm the CIO of Employee Experience and Corporate Technology. Um, Arup, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Arup Nanda. I'm the Global Head of uh, Database Architecture in Enterprise Systems. And I'm Sarita Bax. I'm the Chief Information Architect for Firmwide Data Management. Awesome. So with that, let's kind of kick off the presentation. Let me move over there we go so why the data lake via data mesh architecture um <clears throat> there's a couple of things that we want to really want to be able to do as we think about the, the public cloud and moving data into the public cloud um, one analogy that i always share when we think about the the public cloud based on my years of experience and also being at jpmc is you really want to think about when, when moving into the cloud like a city planner right so you want to build the most as efficient city as possible as you're moving into the into the cloud, because um, if you if if you're only focusing on just landing data there for cost savings and not thinking holistically about what you're trying to achieve, one you can easily build data swamps, and two you can very easily build very inefficient cities, um, an inefficient city in the cloud. Imagine you know going through a city and you got buildings and roads sitting all in the wrong places, so then you're not able to easily navigate that city to get to where you need to get to. If you approach the cloud and not thinking holistically, it's very easy for you to be able to create a very inefficient city in the cloud. So what we wanted to do is definitely build a data lake in the cloud, um, move away from trying to build data lakes on premise, given the benefits that you gain by building data lakes in the cloud where so we can democratize our data. That's typically what everyone wants to do. Definitely take advantage of maximizing the availability and accessibility of, of analytics and, and the services that the cloud has to offer. Um, and definitely making sure that we're focusing on not just the technology, but the business outcomes that we were with measurable benefit fits that can really drive the change that we're trying to, to achieve. And to do that, we wanted to look at our cloud strategy from three major principles. Typically, everyone looks at cost savings, right? So definitely that's the lens we wanted to look at. And companies look at from a business value perspective, what use cases can we land in the cloud to unlock the business value or remove any pain points and also with the opportunity to create, also be able to create new opportunities. And then the third one, which is really important that really rounds out the approach is data reuse, right? This is now the opportunity. You'll hear me talk about <clears throat> puddles, ponds, lakes. So think of puddles as something very specific to solve a very specific problem. Um, then you start to get into your ponds where 
that data can be used to solve multiple types of, of problems as a much broader context or bounded context. And then you have your lake. So you'll see here, the focus that we were trying to do is move um, puddles to ponds and ponds to a lake. So then you create this logical lake and then um, opening up the opportunity to democratize that data within that logical lake. To do that, <clears throat> it's really important now to move towards a more modern platform of how you think about data lakes. And this is where the data mesh architecture um, comes in um, to be able to unlock that, that, that value that, we, uh, that I share. So what does that mean? One, moving away from your traditional monolithic lake. So that's your typical build everything and Hadoop, um, central lo a lake, one team that owns it, <clears throat> managing that lake, which typically doesn't scale very effectively. Two, we want to build a more loosely coupled architecture for data. So the way I describe it, it's your microservices architecture for data. You start now thinking about your data as products, that's your bounded context, um, having a set of infrastructure, data lake, uh, data lake capabilities, infrastructure capabilities that allows the data, data products to be able to then um, um, be a part of the logical lake, um, which is why we want to build aggregate fit for data, fit for purpose data products. And then enabling the actual data engineers who owns these products to be able to have a distributed pipeline to ingest the data into the cloud um, in order to actually um, create the data products that we're actually trying to then um, make available to the rest of the ecosystem. So what does that sort of look like at a high level? So this is where the cloud, the public cloud fits very nicely with implementing a data mesh architecture. You certainly can try to implement this on premise. We are actually implementing and taking the same principles on premise because we wanna create a hybrid data lake. I think everyone knows when you're moving into the public cloud, you don't just hit the easy button, everything just moves into public cloud. Um, regulatory constraints um, that you have to deal with, um, definitely legal entities that data that you may be using to get the proper approvals. Um, those are sort of things that can um, take some time to be able to land into the cloud, but you want to start taking advantage of being able to create these data as products, but leveraging both your public and private cloud becomes a very important piece. That's where you see that hybrid lake consumption off to the, off to the right on the consumption layer. So you, your sources, that's your typical sources, APIs, files, Hadoop clusters, relational database that's being fed into this um, data lake. As you can see there, each AWS account <clears throat> becomes a, da a data product. Right, with the full capability of having those products be representing a specific domain or sub products with a team being able to own that product end to end. You build it, you own it, you run it, right? So that's why it's important to identify your data domains. You stop the proliferation of data puddles that we have on premise and now moving them into ponds by treating them as products. Um, and you really begin to move towards more of an agile sort of way of thinking about your products, your data as products. As you can see at the top, AWS provides, I think one is a very important managed service that they introduced, which is lake formation. So I built data lakes in the cloud before. The hardest, one of the hardest things is the entitlements, right? So S3 is at the object level. And now you got to figure out how do you do your IM roles and structure your data um, in order to give the fine grain entitlement, which is a difficult thing to do. Or you have to buy another product that overlays on top of that to give you that capability which then forces you to have to start thinking about how do you in integrate that with, with the other managed services, which <clears throat> as you start going down that path, now you start treating AWS more like a, a, a data center than really um, <clears throat> leveraging as a cloud provider. <clears throat> so with Lake Formation, bringing the, the layer that's laid on top of S3, now we got the capability to do entitlements and fine grade entitlements and have that integration with the higher managed services um, like Athena and Russia Spectrum, which Arup is going to get into more detail about. And then you get into more of the having as part of the data infrastructure's platform, your metadata management, your data catalog, telemetry. The data federation is our ability to be able to federate out to have things like Dreamio that can connect to that federation to be able to access those products. So if I have workloads, I can't move into the cloud, but I still want to take advantage of those products. They can seamlessly have access to the data that's sitting in the cloud as well as the data products that's actually sitting on premise. So then therefore we're reducing um, copying and truly have a hybrid data lake. So as you move to this model, the, the, the really important piece of this is when you start to get into thinking of that 
data product thinking, data as products. This is the hardest part of the journey, in my opinion. Technology is pretty straightforward. AWS Lake Formation has really provided the capability. There are some options there we have, you have to think about when you're thinking how to do a data mesh architecture into the cloud, which Arupa is going to get into a little uh, more um, later in the presentation. But shifting to this product thinking, it's a, it's a different way of thinking. And we started this journey, me and Sarita um, helping to, to lead this um, last year. It took us probably about two to three months to really just to, to get alignment on the common taxonomy and the terminology. Uh, as we started the conversation, what Sharita shared, it was a little bit talking past each other. I think we all were sort of saying the same thing. We think we're saying the same thing, um, but it took some time to really lay down that taxonomy and make sure we're speaking the same language. We applied the domain-driven techniques to form those bounded contexts so we can make sure we have the roughly right approach. We was not trying to make this academic. And the way we did that, we just, once again, going back to a city planner, we looked at the workloads that we were bringing into the cloud based on those workloads, what data they were using. And then we figured out where was the reuse across that data and start to really have the conversation about what are the bounded context for those products. <clears throat> and then last thing I would just say, we, you know, we have to take performance considerations uh, as we make trade-offs on how much we wanna loosen that bounded context. And we probably start more coarse grain because it's easier to start coarse grain and then you may then make that more fine grain. No different than the same principles when you're um, moving a monolith to a microservices architecture. Typically you start more coarse grain and then you may become more fine grain as you begin to learn by doing and evolve on this type of approach. Um, so with that, kind of now you understand how we're thinking about data lakes, how do we think about data mesh architecture, the important principle around the data product thinking. I'm gonna turn it over to Sarita to go in a little bit more detail to talk about our journey with the data as, as products. Sarita. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks. So what is a data product? Well, we can say the bullet point that we have up on the slide, it's a broad collection of related data. Well, does, does that really tell us much? Is there a science to the words broad collection or related data? No, there isn't the science. The same way as we talk about bounded context and interpreting the capabilities and the content of our applications, the form of the bounded context, there's a lot of opinion in, in defining that. And the same thing holds true here. Um, we have a lot of subject matter experts in the bank and in the industry that have been in financial services and understand data and have been working with data for years. And so there's a rough sense of what data is related to each other. And we may get it right the first time and we may not get it right the first time. And we adjust and adapt and figure out the definition of related data and what has to, what makes the most sense to be together in a single product. Um, in terms of um, product ownership, again, roughly right. Who is the most appropriate set of people to help us advise on what the right product is and what data belongs in a product. We'll take an example. We have um, on, on the right-hand side of the slide, wholesale credit risk, party, and trade and position data as examples of product. Now, those of you on the call may be thinking, well, you know, I really care about derivatives data a lot and the derivatives activity I do, I think of as a total different unit of information than my collateral data or my cash deposits data. And we can argue for days, you know, um, is the trade and position product the right way to think about the universe and all the trades in the bank, all the positions, all the balances are one product or is derivatives one product? And we're probably both right. Um, but it's a way of thinking and it's a way of starting to collect their data into common um, locations with common owners so that we can manage the quality and the co-location of that data into a single product. So the product owner in this case has a very difficult task of first defending that that product ought to be its own product and making sure they understand the boundaries of the product. What, what kinds of data, what data sets belong in that product and what data sets maybe don't belong in the product and hopefully advise on where that should be. And so, so that product owner acts as a gatekeeper um, then we'll have sub-products, as you see in the, in the little um, you know, text in the circles. 
uh, you know, cash, derivatives, securities, collateral are, are some examples of subproducts within trade and position. We have also subproducts in the risk section and the party section. And each of those subproducts have their own sub bounded context, sub domains of data and ownership. And that's where we get into more of a data owner responsibility that is responsible for the quality of the data, the risk mitigation of the data, um, and general oversight and confidence building in the data set itself. In addition to a product owner, we think about the technical owner. As JR mentioned, our goal is to create lake accounts that are aligned to the products. And so we'll need a lead technical owner that will own that lake account and own the creation of the data sets and ingestion of the data sets into the product. And all of this is kind of encompassed by the data mesh where the products can interact with each other. Um, in terms of you know, physical instantiation of the product, again, as they are mentioned, it is not necessarily infrastructure bound. We may have one product in the cloud and another product on prem, but logically they can connect to each other and interact with each other through the data mesh as a way of uh, describing those relationships and associations between the products. Well, let's get into the, the actors um, some more. So we talked a little bit about the data product owner. Again, they are responsible for the product. They're responsible for uh, allowing data in and out of the product. They're also going to keep an eye on duplication of data, either within their product, across other products. And for now, it's okay. We can, we can allow some um, very uh, uh, precise and authorized duplication of data. We're not saying right now, we must have a single copy of data only in one place for all consumers to consume. We might be, have to say, well, you know, for performance reasons, co-location reasons, we will create a controlled copy of the data and understand that that data lives potentially in two places. But very, very much controlled is the goal so that we don't go out of sync between versions of the truth between the data. And the technical owner, again, as we spoke about, really uh, focuses on the implementation itself, the lake account, um, and all of the ingestion and transformation executions within the product. Can we flip to the next? Um, and then let's just get into the contributor and the consumer role. And that could be one and the same person or one and the same team. The contributors are taking advantage of the data that are in the products. And they themselves may be further enhancing and modifying and transforming the data and contributing additional information back to the product, the same product that they consumed from, or they may contribute and own a secondary product that is, you know, um, taking trades and positions data and then calculating risk exposures. So one would read and consume from a trade and position product and then contribute and own the risk exposures that are calculated in the risk products, for example. And, and there's a very a big fluidity between which role one plays at any moment in time, or probably all three roles, the owner, the contributor, and the consumer at any given moment. And then finally, with the, the CDO, the chief data officers um, across the firm, uh, work in partnership with the data owners and make sure that there is the right controls in place, the right accountability, uh, the right oversight to help lead and define the data products. So I'll pass it on to the group for more of the technicalities. Thank you, Sarita. Um, so uh, GR talked about uh, why we should do it in the first place. And then Sarita, thank you for saying what we should do this. And I, list, uh, and I will talk about how to do this. Now, Sarita can introduce a concept called uh, the contributor, which I also call producer, the data producer. Now, what, what JR mentioned is that instead of sending everything into a single location or a single lake, now it will go to a fit for purpose store, which the, what that means is that there'll be multiple data stores, not just one store where, uh, where contributors of the producers have to send the data to. Now that's a big a lot of questions for producers and consumers. Let's say producers will say, now that I have a choice, 
of multiple data stores or multiple ponds or, or the puddles, as, as Jair put it. And how do I write that into those individual stores? Because depending upon my specific data product, I need to write into a specific store. And by the way, that could be dynamic also, because data products keep on evolving. So will the puddles and the ponds and they'll go into lakes as well. So I can't just make it fixed and other thing. And I have to make sure that the producer helps to make sure that when something is introduced, they don't have to rewrite the entire application. And likewise, there will be a movement of data from one store into another store. For example, things will be clarified. Data products will probably create another data product. They'll go to a totally different store, et cetera. And when that happens, they also want to do some transformation. And that has to be pretty simple. Uh, and the transformation has to, has to be specific to a, a kind of a data product. Take, for example, an engineering product can say zero and one as a value for inactive and active. But for a business product, that may not work. They might be converted into an inactive and active actual words. So there will be actually a presentation layer that kind of transforms the data into that. And consumers who actually consume the product, they will ask these questions. Well, now that I have this variety of things at uh, different places, how do I find out where my data is located? It's like going to a mall and trying to find out exactly which store I have to go to to get this thing. But the most important is the next one. Just because I find something somewhere, does it mean that I can use it? As a financial organization, we have to produce a lot of regulatory reports and compliance reports we have to file with the government. We cannot ever identify the data as okay or, 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 or acceptably accurate. It has to be absolutely accurate. So in that case, the data consumer, how can they find out that they can trust the data or not? They have to know exactly where it came from, who all are using it. And if I, can, if I do know exactly what data I want, who can grant me access to the data and how can I use it seamlessly? Think about this way, 70% of the world uh, is covered by water. If that is the case, then how come we have droughts? Just because we have water doesn't mean that we can actually start using it. If you walk along the road and you find a puddle of water on the, on the road side of the road, would you drink it even if you are thirsty? Probably not because you just don't know how contaminated that water is. You simply cannot trust it. But you would go down and, and go to the grocery store and buy a bottle of water and drink it because you trust that must have come from something. That's exactly how the data is. Just because the data is available doesn't mean that is useful. And just because it is useful and there doesn't mean that it's actually useful to the consumer itself. So how do we make sure that we actually have it? Next slide, please. And this is where we built up this, this capability in the technology components. In the heart of it, we have something called a data ingester as opposed to something called an ETL process. So the data ingester is where all the contributors or the data producers send the data into. And the ingester then checks up the, the, the system. First of all, if the data is not registered, it checks the, it puts the registration in our data inventory system, which is the catalog as well. Then it also does a few other things. It does a data quality check that if that is from data to data, bottle to bottle, pond to pond, product to product also, depending upon that. And that, that uh, quality checker is extremely flexible to, to introduce new quality rules. Then we track the lineage as it moves along. Anytime something changes, the ingester automatically records the lineage. And then from the, 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 the data ingester itself, we send to something called a router. And in the router, we send it to the appropriate data store based on the registration. And this is the key component here. Instead of being fixed of a route from the producer to the, the ultimate data store, we determine at the time of ingestion where the destination data is going to be and we route it to the appropriate location. That way, when you build up new data products or data pods or puddles or ponds uh, dynamically, we can change it in one place. That's in the inventory space. And then the router automatically reads it and then routes it in the appropriate location. Sometimes you can't identify the schema that comes with it because obvious, for obvious reasons, sometimes it's not possible. In that case, we don't let it use, get to be used by the ultimate consumer. We land in a raw area, then we infer the schema from it and update the data inventory system. By doing so, that becomes the system of record for identifying where the data is. And that's, that's, that's an extremely, extremely important thing to understand. That becomes the brain of the system. Next slide, please. 
But the question comes from that, if I'm a customer of this thing, and I use the word customer for a specific reason, because I could be anybody in this thing. I could be a producer, I could be a consumer, I could be a, 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 uh, simply an engineer trying to find out if my data is flowing correctly or not. How do I find out exactly where the data is located and can I trust or not? But to answer the question, the first thing is that the customers will try to find out in the cart lock, in the inventory system. From the system, they find out the lineage as well. Uh, how the data has moved in. They will also find out what kind of quality checks have been done on this, but everything puts, it gets put into what we call a data marketplace. Next slide, please. And this becomes the another, or to also the data supply marketplace also becomes another way. The next question we asked for the consumer, how do I get access to the data? Just because it's available doesn't mean that I can go and access it immediately. I need to have proper entitlement to access it. So there's this data inventory, which we also call catalog, that combined with the central entitlement system is extremely important for us to make sure that we have the access controls on, on the data itself. And to do that, we link that central entitlement system to our corporate identity systems, which in many cases, you probably have Active Directory or some of those ways, you know, in our case, we use Active Directory, et cetera, to connect to it. And that's how the consumers get a single entitlement option to go into this multiple places. Then how do I access it? That's another question as well. Uh, there are two ways of accessing something. First is that most people use SQL. And for SQL, because we use AWS extensively, for central entitlement system, we use lake formation. And for SQL access, we use two things, Athena and Redshift Spectrum. Athena is for a single threaded system, very, very quick, uh, probably cheapest option possible. Redshift Spectrum is multi-threaded and it's a cluster based system, but of course we pay for the cluster as well. So based on the use case, how, how soon, how fast you want to get the data out of it with SQL, we use it. But not everything is uh, SQL based. We also use EMR as well, which is not shown here, but we do that. But the next question actually is important that sometimes, as, as Sarita mentioned, we put the data into multiple data products. They need to be combined together. Should the customer know everything to, to get the data? Currently it is, but in our journey. In our journey going forward, we want to introduce the GraphQL. In that case, the customer simply says, I want to get X and the GraphQL, I'll figure out what is the best source of the getting that X back into system. That's a journey we want to continue in the future as well. Next, please. So this is, a, I don't want to walk into that. It is there for, for our reference only. This is a reference architecture we just put here for how we have put together the AWS, various AWS components uh, so that we can have accomplished all these things. We have a leg formation account. On the leg formation, we have multiple buckets like a raw area, trusted area, refined area, et cetera. When the data lands, which is not defined yet, uh, or the schema is not derived yet, it goes into raw area. And then from there, we run an ETL job, extract the schema, put into trusted, refined, et cetera. Sometimes we know the data is absolutely refined, is already there in the, in the glue catalog. Um, let's say it's a new partition of a sing, uh, an existing data set. In that case, we don't have to put in the raw area at all. In that case, in the router, we, just, we set the destination directly to the refined bucket. Likewise, if we use some other bucket for something else like operational adjustment, et cetera, we do that too, again, using the router. And this is, the, this is where the flexibility and the power of router comes in here. Um, all the systems I mentioned here are just for references only. I'm not going to go through it, but leg formation becomes our single point of entitlement and the catalog. But that brings another question, which is a very important question. A form like ours, which is built up of multiple lines of businesses, it becomes a challenge to create a single leg formation space for, to, to get it to the entire form. Because remember that each lines of business, they behave like almost like a separate company and they have their own priorities as well and on the different cadence. So how, how can we make sure that we have, we use leg formation, a single entitlement engine, yet allow them to go flexibly? Next slide, please. To do that, we came up with this call a, a, a federation of leg formation accounts, not just single leg formation account for everything. So in that case, each line of business, they have a central leg formation account for their own. And that's where they can create as many producer accounts and the consumer accounts as they want. And they can put that in, in their own central leg formation account. 
Likewise, all the lines of businesses that can create their own line, own uh, uh, leg formation accounts. But that becomes another interesting question. In that case, how do we allow cross connectivity with, across the lines of businesses? To do that, we create resource links when something is required. And by doing so, in one uh, specific glue catalog in one line of business, you, you will be able to see the, the other glue catalogs in other lines of business. And if you need access to that, you would request access and you'll, grant, you'll be given the access back to it so you can do it. So even though they're federated, we still behave like the, like the United States of America. So every state is independent to some extent, but the foreign uh, relationships and, and the defense is still in the central place. And that's one thing we do by creating this federation. But one thing becomes a problem in this case. Now there are multiple glue catalogs. How can a person, a, a, an employee in JPMC can find out where a, a specific data element they're looking for is located? To do that, we also created something called a central JPMC account, which is a single glue catalog, or which is a superset of catalog from multiple sources. We present it over there. We can look it up there. And that also, we use that one to sync up with our form-wide catalog, which is a superset of everything in, in, the, in, the, in this form. So that way, we have a single source of truth that goes into to, to update our firmware catalog. And we can also look it up here as well. So that's how we use our lake formation strategy. Next slide, please. Going back to our so the problems, let's just recap the solutions here. The producers ask the question, how can I write data into various data stores? Well, I just mentioned to do that. First of all, we do that through an ingester mechanism. An ingester is nothing but a single point of entry, a logical point of entry. It's not a physical one place where everything is stored. Depending upon the use, we put it in multiple places. For example, there will be an ingester on, on prem. There is an ingester on cloud as well. It has to be because that two different things we ingested. But the concept, the, the code base is exactly the same in this place. So then that ingester then routes it according to the, the destination set in the catalog itself. How can I move the data from one store to another store? Once again, through the ingester and the router. How can I transform everything? Once again, through the same thing, ingester process, that's where the transformation can happen. And if the, a special transformation is required, every data owner can take it out, do the transformation, and they put back into the ingester, and it goes to the same process of, of quality checks and conformance, everything else, to make sure that the consumer can actually trust it. The consumer, how can I know my, where my data is? Look into the catalog, which is also called inventory. How can I trust the data? We saw the lineage. We saw the data quality checks performed on it, et cetera. How did it come from? Once again, lineage. Who all are using it? That's something we also saw in the data marketplace as well, which I didn't show it here, but will be useful to show that. And then who can grant me access to the data itself? So first of all, if I find out who the owner of the data is, which is in the catalog, then I can request it and have a single entitlement system. That's what gives grants me entitlement to, to whatever I need. And that is tied back to my identity in the corporate identity. That way I have a single identity and I can go anywhere on the cloud, on-prem, everywhere to get the entitlement system. And then how can I access it seamlessly? The seamlessly is of course, is also a subjective thing. Today we allow SQL to, to allow it almost to, to, go, to go to any store and get the access to it. We also allow Python. We also allow some parts of JDBC, et cetera, to do it. But in the future, our roadmap is to use a GraphQL so that the customer doesn't have to re explicitly understand where the data is located or write a query to get that thing. It will get the GraphQL will hopefully get that thing answer. So with that said, I just wanted to make sure that we understand the technology part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Arup. Thanks, Sarita. So we entered this portion of our Q&A. Hopefully, you got some insight into how we're thinking about data lakes, how we're building a data mesh architecture, a data product thinking, how AWS helps us to um, take advantage of building out a data mesh architecture. Um, I think a couple of key things just to, just to reiterate. Um, taking a cloud, if you can see, we're taking a cloud first approach where we're leveraging the ADOS managed services to implement our data mesh architecture. Um, secondly, by leveraging those managed services um, and with lake formation and treating our data products as separate accounts, as you saw with the data producing accounts, we actually improve our, our, our security posture, right? So by having separate AWS accounts and you get your separation of data, even Hopefully not. If one account gets compromised, you don't get access to all the data, which typically what happens 
if you're treating as a, a monolithic monolithic lake. So a lot of advantages to the approach of doing data as products. We're just starting this journey, so there's still a lot for us to learn. Um, it's a very large firm, so really rationalizing the, the data as products, as well as us going on this product operating model to think um, about uh, products in general within, within the firm um, is the journey that we're on. And, and we're looking forward to actually how we land this and really seeing the advantages that we can take, a, um, take advantage of, of having this um, sort of architecture and speeding up our ability to do machine learning and AI, which really then allows you to start to transform yourself um, when you start to reimagine what you can do as, as a company. So with that, we can turn over to Q&A, Scott. I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if people want to ask questions, please throw it in the Q&A. People can upvote uh, those as well. So, um, you know, if somebody asks a, a really awesome question, then we've got that. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll use my uh, privilege as, as one of the uh, <laughs> panelists to ask a, a question up front. Uh, which was, you know, you talked about data product scope and, and you know, sub products kind of, it seemed like maybe that's mapping at the domain level and, and things like that. How, and, and you were talking as well about one data product from a logical standpoint might be federated into multiple actual physical storage locations. And then it's kind of you know, how you zipper that, that back up or how you allow that, like, how do you think about the scope of a data product? Um, because that, that, that gets, that's a question where, especially when people are starting out, they get so bogged down around, like, how do I actually get going? What should be my first data product? And, and, you know, you talked about evolution as well. So if you want to talk about how you, you think about things evolve along that process as well, that'd be awesome. So Sarita, I'm gonna just take one crack and you can jump in here. Okay. One thing is uh, one being a CIO of, of one of the lines of businesses um, within the firm. Um, and we've been socializing this strategy with the other lines of business. Um, anytime you move into the cloud, um, like I said, thinking like a city planner, you have to be practical, right? And not academic. Um, so what we did was, um, and, and I think the other piece to it is also, <laughs> you got to think about the business value that you're delivering, right? So as technologists, sometimes we get caught up in building the most te elo eloquent technical solution and we frustrate the business because we're not moving fast enough and we just say, hey, it's one more quarter, one more quarter, one more quarter before you know a year went by, two years went by and the business is still not reaping the benefits of what this architecture should bring. So what we did to get started out, we actually literally working with the various leaders within um, within a particular line of business. And we looked at, hey, what are the applications or workloads we wanna move into the cloud that, that align to like a data lake um, sort of reference architecture, right? Then looking at those workloads, we looked at the business value that we was gonna be able to deliver and the timing. And we built out a roadmap, right? So you're talking just within my line of business, you know, in anywhere from four to 500 apps. Um, you can't move all four or 500 of those apps. Right, much bigger when you're talking 6,000 for the entire firm. Now you're trying to take those four to 500 and you want to be iterative. And we actually narrow down that roadmap thinking in context of a year. What can we do in a year? And we looked at when we prioritized the business value that was associated with that. Once we had a line of sight of those apps and some of those was data processing, some of those were truly just um, BI tools that sits on top of that data because you want to do some reporting. And some of those was machine learning and AI. So we wanted to make sure we had a good mix of the various use cases. Once we identified that list, this is where working closely with Sarita, we dug deep into those workloads to try to then understand what data are these workloads using? What's the synergy? Who's producers, who's contributors, who consumers? And that's actually how we started the journey. So that way it's not academic. Two, we're using real use cases. And three, we can actually deliver business value, which then creates that momentum and that wind behind your back as you, as you begin to execute this. So I don't know anything else you want to add to that. Sir. Yeah, I just, I just want to reiterate that we absolutely did not sit down and say, what are all the products we ever want to create ever in our lives, right? Because we can be sitting for months doing that little debate of trade and position versus derivative or what other product names I want to give it. 
And um, the other thing that we learned, is, as JR mentioned, with the roadmaps and the modernization journeys that we took through a couple of use cases, um, we noticed that a lot of times those use cases were heavily consuming data that was created by others. And so that started teaching us that we can't be purists about thinking about bringing all that data as first class authoritative data to start. We can start thinking about what data are they authoritative for that project that we were focused on and say, okay, that's a sub product of data that we can create and decide what product to put it into and make it very iterative. And then the data that they needed as dependencies of consumers, well, we would negotiate with those authoritative sources and say, if you were to create a data product, where would you land this data? Are you ready to go on to your modernization journey? If you're not ready, we don't want to stop progress of an application team that wants to move forward into the cloud. And so we would create what we were talking about, the authorized copy of data, and just make sure that the data is there for the workload to run. We have to get some wins, some business value under our belt. The other thing is um, where we talked about creating a late account for a product. That's great as we're really building up all of the products in the cloud. But we know full well that we have a tremendous estate of data all over the bank, not in the cloud. And so for that, metadata is our friend, right? We create the catalog. I know that sounds so nerdy, but we create the catalog of where the data exists throughout the firm, on-prem, in private cloud, in our data centers, and just know where that data is and call that a logical product and think about where the data is, where it's authorized to be created and how it should start advancing itself into that target state product. But knowing that that journey is going to take a while. So it's totally iterative, built. And, and, and again, I wanna, I wanna reiterate, sometimes we got the products wrong, that's okay, right? We said, oh, it should have been part of a derivatives product. And we said, well, that was silly. We were forcing the application owner to rewrite their ingestion code and their structures six times for different products, asset classes within a trade and position. And we said, no, that's crazy. Don't create a derivative and a collateral and a loans product, create a trade and position product and optimize for reuse of code. And so we iterated and, and that was okay. Okay, yeah, that's, that's super. I, I, I want to add one thing to that one as well. So, so this is exactly why, uh, uh, we will never be able to be completely say that this is the data product and this is the whole inventory of it. We will never do it. And towards the end of it, towards sunset of our journey as well, we cannot even say that. Uh, that thing will be iterative process. It will be, it will, that's the reason why it's extremely important to be flexible into that, that ingestion process and route it to the appropriate location and change it on the fly as well. It cannot be hard coded, you know, like for the lack of better words, uh, into a very specific source to a specific destination. It has to be flexible, and that's what we have done in our technology infrastructure. Awesome. So um, I, I'm happy to read out the questions, or if you want to choose your questions, uh, whichever one you want to do for the Q and A. Yeah, I, I see one question. I think it would be great. I'll ask this one because me and Sarita, we talked about this one. Sarita, probably an example we can go to, but I'm gonna read the question. Um, it was actually in the chat. So how do you define the boundary of responsibility of a data product? Example, consumers may want to create derivatives of data products. Self-service access to a data product increases its value. However, now downstream consumers of that derivative data product are now dependent on the quality of that derivative. When and where does the downstream responsibility of a data product end? You want to... So first of all, we want to get into the mindset of producers of data, that that data better be of a decent quality. Let's not call it perfect quality, but let's call it decent quality. That's fit for purpose for their consumer. Now they may not know who all their consumers are at the start. They may only know that one or two teams are intending to use the data, but at least but the, the quality of the data better be at a good level for those intended consumers. And now as more consumers come in, you're absolutely right. 
you know, you don't know what fit for purpose is until you get to know the use case. And producers may be producing what they think is the complete set of data, but likely is not fitting the need of the consumer. And it can call a couple of different directions. But first of all, we have to have a glossary of terms because my definition of, let's say, notional when it comes to derivatives again, may be completely different than your definition of notional when it comes to loans. And so if we use the word notional, we're in trouble if we don't have a glossary of business terms. And so that glossary can make sure that the producer is declaring what they have. And if the consumer is not comfortable with it or wants to derive further, either there could be a conversation with the producer to say, producer, you better make more data for me because I need it, have a handshake there. Or the consumer may tell, have a negotiation and say, you're not ready to produce for me. I'll produce it and I'll contribute it back to your product. Will you take possession of my data set? Can I contribute it? Or the consumer may say, I don't like what this producer is doing. I'm going to derive further and land it in my own product. That's a bad scenario, but it's a scenario that happens because the further we get from the authoritative data, the, the chain of custody starts you know, diminishing and the quality of the data starts um, going downhill. And so we want to control for that. Like Arup talked about, we have lineage. We know when the data is used. We know when the data is created. And we can try to understand what that chain of custody is to, to defend ourselves from derivatives of data. Yeah, and, and I would say just to, to add to that, and we're, once again, I'm going to reiterate, we're on this journey. So some of these things we're discovering as we're going, and you're like, ooh, okay, how, we, how, how do we want to address that? So by no means are we saying we have this all figured out. Um, I think we, we've taken a lot of the learning. Sarita has been on this journey before, you know, within the firm. I'm two years into the firm. Sarita's been in the firm much longer than me. And of course, in our on-premise cloud, there's some learnings around the data and how we think about lineage and ownership. So I think Sarita was able to draw from that. So as we go into the public cloud to make sure we don't repeat some of the sins of the past, but on the same token, we're also learning some new things that comes up as we start to take this new way of thinking of, about data's products. Is that fair? A fair summarization, Sarita? Yeah, I just think that we have to go in here knowing that we can't be purists. Yes, exactly. Andy, <laughs> we're, we're on the bleeding edge. D data mesh is on the bleeding edge. And, yeah, and you know, um, it's it's funny, the concept of, of data product marketing hasn't really been discussed, but at some point it kind of almost, be, you know, it's, it's part of your data as a product. You have product market, you do your you know, your actual product management as well of going and actually interviewing these people, of interviewing your consumers, of talking to your potential consumers, and they may not know about your data product. And you say, oh, well, I've got this thing or, or whatever. And so, yeah, it's... it's and, th and that's actually, I would tell you, that's probably going to be a big one for JPMC because all the lines of businesses, all the data that we have. So th definitely, I think that's probably going to be a very important part of this as you start thinking about... Um, making everyone, helping everyone to be aware what data is available, how do you market that? What's the value that it brings? One thing that JPMC is shifting is really to our product op model, which is really having product owners, um, product line owners, and really thinking end to end. That means from the user experience to the actual cost of that product, right? Um, and also um, whether the consumers are actually having satisfaction from using that product. So. Truly thinking end to end is something that the shift that JPMC is trying to make holistically in the firm um, from a, a sort of a product oriented way. Some, at some point, I want uh, data user experience ducks to actually be a thing, just so that I can make lots of bad puns. But you know, that, that's like more that. a, a personal thing. Um, hey, I see another question that I was going to answer. Yeah. Um, on the Q and A, and I'm gonna start it, and then Arup, you can certainly jump in. I'm gonna kind of put two. I think I'm gonna put two questions together. So one was the, are you applying RBAC at the metadata level? Um, and th so remember we mentioned that we're using Lake Formation, which leverages Glue catalog. Um, think of Glue at the technical metadata. Um, Lake Formation um, in combination with Glue is where we get the entitlement. So that allows us to put entitlements on tables, um, where you're, how you're grouping your data. 
that then allows you to put entitlements on the columns so you can restrict which columns a user has access to. Um, now AWS is introducing the ability to do not just at the um, table and column level, they're also now introducing row level. So now we can do one more click down um, around that fine grain entitlement. And then the last thing that they're introducing is um, attribute level, right? So ABAC, that's also going to be integrated also within um, Lake Formation. And the beauty thereby leveraging that capability that's already in Lake Formation along with Glue, which is your technical metadata catalog, because we have other tools that's playing our business metadata catalog and keeping those in sync is really important. Um, by leveraging that managed service that's in AWS, all the other services that then sits on top and that's integrated with Lake Formation, we benefit now from a SQL engine to data warehouse, to machine learning and AI, to doing EMR using Spark. Um, and now I know um, AWS is looking at integrating their um, graph database also with their Lake Formation. We've really been pushing AWS to think of Lake Formation as a first class citizen, just like they've done with S3. So when any new managed service come along, they should be thinking about should it integrate with Lake Formation. And by us pushing on that, and we're leveraging those capabilities in Lake Formation, we benefit as we're leveraging and taking a cloud first approach that that entitlement structure, that fine grained entitlement actually then is managed and honored by those other managed services that work with Lake Formation. I don't know if Arup, anything you want to add to that in reference to the metadata um, and lineage also with Sarita touched on. Um, no, actually you covered it all. I'd like to answer one question, actually pretty important, um, if that's okay. Um, okay. How do you control the um, catalog unstructured data and the data base and leg formation approval? I think it's important uh, to understand that. First of all, there are two catalogs we're talking about. One catalog is the glue catalog, which is AWS specific, which is a technical catalog. It's still not enough to do anything because we also have to put our business information as well. That's the reason why we have our form wide catalog, which is a superset of everything and also the as a information for the business as well. So when you talk about unstructured data, I think I'm assuming that you're talking about the scheme, the data that is not schema applied yet. So one of the things we are doing right now, first of all, a schema applied or not doesn't matter. It must be in our form-wide data catalog. So that's there. So that means every data is registered in the form-wide data catalog, whether it's schema applied or not. In fact, sometimes it, it cannot be applied until it comes to the raw bucket, we extract it from there. Then of course, it's go to Google catalog. That's the first one way of we, we are dealing with it. Second is that sometimes we also take the unstructured data as a one single column table. For example, we get police reports and they come from multiple uh, parts of the, of the country and then they're all different. So we take first take that one as a single, actually multiple records, but, but multiple columns where the last column is the one that is flexible. Once we land it in the place, then we extract the schema from it as well. So that's also another way to handle it. Sometimes it's impossible to do it. For example, a picture file or audio file, et cetera. There's no schema to that at all. In that case, it will be simply called a file, but that will be definitely available in the form of data catalog. Awesome. Um, I see another question, um, Arup. I think this will be a good one for, we, maybe we can tag team on this one because uh, we kind of evolved on this one. So this was, I would be curious about the rep reproducibility of a data product process slash pipeline. Yep. Um, did you put in place a CICD process? If yes, who has the authority? Um, I think it's probably good to share a little bit about where we started. We kind of hit some bumps in the road and we sort of shifted to take a different direction because some of the pain that we felt when we, I think we over opinionated the process and the pipeline and now we're trying to adjust to be less opinionated but still having the right control. Do you want to touch on that a little bit in reference to answering that question? Uh, sure. So for, first of all, let's say the one is that uh, reproducibility. There are two parts. I think what you're talking about is the uh, reproducibility of your transformation or, or something you are trying to do in the pipeline and that is absolutely possible by using this our approach of ingesture. Uh, you may also want to, that's also a regular process. So that's why CICD process comes in there. But the next next version comes in, we have to make sure that it goes to the process of actually doing it and make sure it goes through some kind of a testing process. We also create uh, chaos testing to make sure that we we, um, uh, we can handle all the other things come in here as well. Uh, but you also want to find out something else, a data pro product uh, uh, part of the product, uh, reproducibility. That's a little bit different. Like for example, uh, um, uh, 
uh, if I understand correctly, uh, how do you make sure that the same results come from the same data pro product? So I guess that's where, uh, JR, you may want to take it over. I don't know. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So a couple of things here in reference to, that I would like to touch on in reference to the process and the pipeline, the CICD process that I think it's important. Not only we want to share the good, but also the learnings. Like, so when we start out the ingestion pipeline of how the data products are going to be able to produce the data and land the data in the cloud. Um, we took a very opinionated approach in reference to that pipeline, um, using a combination of some open source technology, um, very opinionated around how things get registered and the reproducibility of that, that process and that pipeline to land the data. Um, and it was, over, it was too opinionated, too opinionated to the point where it actually got in the way of the engineers. And um, this is where we sort of then pulled back and went more with an API sort of approach. Um, this is where then the group came in and thinking more about components and libraries and allowing the engineers to combine these things to, to produce their, their process and their pipeline that's landing the data and transforming the data. So this is where um, now we're on that journey where we're trying to simplify. And one thing that I was just say, because we're trying to find that strike that balance between um, being opinionated with the proper controls to make sure that it's following the same set of steps that we want um, all distributed pipelines to follow, but on the same token, giving the engineers the autonomy they need to be able to move as fast as possible. And um, this is where it becomes important to make sure you don't boil the ocean. And one rule that I, I know I constantly advise, very easy to make things hard and it's very hard to make things simple. Naturally, engineers build things in a very hard way, unfortunately. And then we realize we've overcomplicated and we actually got in the way of the engineer. So this is why I would just say around that reproducibility um, and how you start to think about building that process and that pipeline, you got to strike that balance between giving the engineer something that has controls baked in it, um, but at the same token, not over baking it or being too opinionated in reference to what you're building to be able to land that data and transform that data. Um, when it comes to the lineage and the transformation, we took more of, hey, let's make the API simple to land the data. This is what a group team is building around the ingester. But once the data is land and you're going through the transformation, that reproducibility and the lineage that you need to be able to build and even time travel of that data, this is where we're pushing now more of, think of it as design patterns, just like your gang of four. There's all different ways you can do that, right? So whether using step functions with Lambda, you know, whether using Delta, Delta, Delta Lake with, with, with step functions, with Lambda, there's different ways you can solve that. So we didn't want to over opinionate that, give the engineers some time to try different ways of, of being able to, to implement that. And then like any product, you live, you learn, you evolve, and then you figure out and find the patterns and then you pull that back in that then becomes reusable for the engineer. So it's a very slippery slope, but it's important that you don't over opinionate or make it overly complicated. And so, uh, you know, the self-service data platform, you know, uh, one question that people talk about with that with data mesh is for whom? And it's like, is it for the producers or the consumers? And the answer is yes, but like, where do you focus? And uh, where, where do you put the, that effort? Um, but like, you know, another thing is, is a lot of people are doing versioning and not just of the code, but the code as data, right? Or the data as code or, or, you know, that you're saying, okay, I need to be able to have that reproducibility of that data in and of itself or that it's versioned. And so I know if I had this weird insight and then I come back and that data has changed, like, right. can, I, can I roll back to that, that version or anything like that? Are you doing a lot with that or because it seemed like with the ingester maybe it's all kind of real time or do you do like the transforms when you're creating a version of the data product is like at a specific point or is it kind of across the map let me uh, take that first one jay i think you will take that one first of all uh, scott what you mentioned that uh, which way you focus producer or the consumer that's the most dangerous thing to say you cannot focus on only one of them you have to focus on both of them it's like a building a store uh, you say, oh, I'm just going to make a store available for the suppliers to supply to the and put in the cell. But consumers, oh, they can wait. Well, that's it's kind, of, kind of useless as well, right? Okay. So we do both of them to make sure that. So that's what we are doing. We are doing at both fronts. 
But in terms of that, uh, the data products, the worsening change, uh, one thing I have to also mention that, that ingester is not a real time ingester and then it's not hard coupled to the actual data stores. We know that we have multiple stores and, and those stores technologies could be also different. For example, sometimes we use Delta Lake for our time uh, uh, temporal activity data itself. Sometimes you don't because it's not necessary to have that, etc. So we can't just get, get hard code or hard couple that ingester into this individual components. Instead, what we do is a pop sub model in between that. So the ingester, actually a bunch of ingester, they send to a publisher in a publisher queue in the middle of it. And then there is a router at the end of it, which rates it completely, not, not one router, multiple routers, rates it, and then routes it to the appropriate location based on the destination folder itself. By doing so, that pops up in the middle of it, that stores a history, and that's configurable, how long we can actually keep that. So first of all, you have way to go back and do a debugging if you have to, it will also allow us to go back in the time and do something if you, with it, if you wanted to do that as well. Or perhaps you can create additional versions of it as of a specific point in time if you did not think about that in the beginning. So in particularly things like uh, machine learning explainability, um, would you have done that differently, et cetera? That is something you can definitely do by using this approach. So it's not a hard coupled thing. And that's a very important design decision we made not to hard couple this together. And that's how it helps us in multiple ways. It helps us in resiliency because a problem in one is not going to bring down everything. That's the thing. But it also helps us in this worsening and debugging, et cetera, as well. So JR, if you want to add to that one. No, I think you, you've covered it. I was well. just going to add, I mean, we absolutely in the bank must version all of our data because we are accountable to the regulators at different points in time. So if, if we cut a, a, a P&L report for the European regulator on a particular business day reporting cycle, we have to reproduce exactly that report for the European regulator. If two hours later, we're gonna cut a P&L report for that close of business date for the US regulator, we have to be able to reproduce that P&L report that we sent to the US regulator, which may have had and edit a refinement and adjustment in between. So reproducibility on versioning is, is something that we have learned through many, many years that we absolutely have to support. And, and Scott, I would just tell you on this journey, like we we're, we were looking at some of those use cases, but we didn't start with those most comp complex use cases, right? Because especially for, um, like for uh, myself and Melissa, who's my counterpart for corporate technology, as Sarita sort of laid out, right? We got to be very careful in taking some of these use cases to the cloud because from a regulatory perspective, as she just mentioned, being able to at some snapshot point in time, you got to be able to reproduce that. We're on that journey and we're doing POCs to understand how we're going to do that. I think we have some ideals about how we're going to do that but not completely flushed out yet. Because remember, there's the technical metadata, which is glue. And then we have our business metadata, which has all the additional things, which is a firmware catalog. That firmware catalog, there's still some opportunity how we improve the versioning there and how that syncs up with our technical metadata catalog to be able to reproduce what Sarita just said. So there's, there's still some gotchas in here that we have to figure out. Uh, when it comes to the versioning and the reproducibility for certain use cases that's extremely important and can have implications to the bank if we don't get that part right. Awesome. And I think Arup, you have a question that you wanna? Yeah, I want to add take this question. How about data product monitoring and observability yeah. and feedback loop for the data drift? Oh, absolutely, this is a vital question. Not only data drift is also process drift. Uh, so this is also important to understand observability of the process. If you look at this entire thing we just laid out in the picture, we have an ingester. The ingester does certain activities and then sends it to the router um, and the router sends it to the appropriate destination based on is the destination we have defined and the other product have been defined. So the two things that happen there. Number one is that, that uh, when you talk about observability, is there a drift in the data itself? For a platform is impossible to find out is a drift or not. For example, am I expected to get one record or two records? Well, something that product data, data platform cannot identify. 
So we use machine learning um, algorithms to find out the patterns in it and anomaly detection. If something is out of the ordinary in this, and then you allow it to, to flag it. What we don't do that we stop it because know that stopping it is going to probably bring some critical process downstream to a halt. So we make that visible in the data marketplace, which we saw earlier as well, where everything else comes together. That's where the trust factor is built up. So the consumer that can decide is that can I trust it based on the observability I have? Like for example, it is a 20% deviation, 20% more records or 20% less records compared to the lab, but normally what they get. So do I trust it or not? That's something they can go back and find out other checks that have been performed there or not. So in, that, in the process of doing that, we can let the consumer make that intelligent decision. Without that, they probably have to go and ask somebody about it, et cetera. That's, the, that's one way. Another way as I think is that timing part of it. Uh, we send re uh, reports to OCC, et cetera. Some of the people who may know uh, the Federal Reserve yield, um, the report we send it, it as of a specific point in time. Now, it, that, that report could be generated and could be pro pro absolutely fine, but the multiple data coming to bring that report to life, if one of them is late, then guess what happens? Your report will be fine, but actually it's wrong report can't really rely on that. So that's where telemetry information as well. So we have data quality checks in that. If the, this, if this particular data stream does not come within this time frame, mark this report as wrong or not possible. So we have this called circuit breakers. We put that as well. And those are built into that as well as a part of data quality. So either you put circuit breaker, so it doesn't move forward for critical elements like that, or you put that, that observe, what you observed back into the data marketplace so the consumer can make a very intelligent decision. Either way, it is sent over to a stream where the data producer is notified automatically as well. So if you are listening to that and also gets visible. So that's how we, we do the, the feedback yeah. loop as well yeah. as the observability. And one thing that will add to that from the monitoring observability from an SRE perspective. So as you start thinking about data as products and you build it, you own it, you run it, you know, there's a lot of conversations around SRE, monitoring, SLAs, SLOs, when it comes to your microservices, right? It's pretty well documented. Data as products, not as well documented. So we're actually figuring this out in reference to how do you think about in terms of the SRE principles, SLOs, SLAs, error budget, and context of data as a product. Um, so we were actually going on this journey as well. So having monitoring around your ingestion, the monitoring observability you need around your transformation that happens once the data lands, and then the monitoring and observability around the consumption layer. You know, where do you want to measure the SLAs and SLOs and where you have those error budget? Because back to your point, Scott, it's either on the consumption side or the producing side, how you link up, think about that holistically. We're actually figuring that out as well and trying to leverage as much as possible with AWS, when it comes to CloudWatch and building out the right dashboards to make sure these data engineers and the SREs who own these products, they have the right monitoring and observability into their product to ensure they're providing the, the experience that the, the, the consumers are using this data. Um, they're, they're delivering the data uh, within those SLAs. Yeah. And some, something I'm seeing coming up a little bit, but it's super early days, is um, even the concept of devs thinking about, I'm going to potentially make this change. And that downstream consumers start to get, you know, like it's not, there's been a change to trunk. It's somebody has, has done, you know, something off of trunk and that they're considering pushing it back in, you know, there's that whole empathy process as well as to how you do alerting up and downstream and, and things like that. It's, it's, it's super, super early days. So, you know, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy we've got, uh, you know, people like yourselves out there that are willing to test the, the edges on this stuff. But um, yeah, I don't want to, I've, I've got like 30 questions here, but I'm going to let the, the, the Q&A, the, the people, I don't want to uh, hog all the time. And we are, we are coming up on the scheduled time. You know, we can, if, if you want to take more time, we've got that, but I also don't want to keep you here until... Sure. You know, it's it's too late or anything like that for yourself. So I'll, I'll just let you know. Okay, that's... I was going. Um, I see Sarita. I don't know if you want to help answer this. I see another question by Andrew. How how do you handle the change in products and the ownership of teams? For example, a team has too many or too few products, 
or work on those products. Um, and I know we're still early in our journey, but we've been talking about some of these aspects of how we think we're going to handle this. I don't know if it's that something you want to. Yeah, the only, the only thing I was thinking about with that question is, like, like we talked about before, that the product is infrastructure agnostic in some cases, or it's a logical lake. The same thing holds true for organizations. The product is agnostic to the organization that's building the data to produce into the product. We may have one team that's building one product, and we may have six teams that are contributing to five products together. And so we should stop thinking about organizational hierarchies and my team owns this and your team owns that product and start thinking about how are we contributing the data that we are authorized to create and produce and contribute that to the holistic product. Now there still has to be a product owner that's gatekeeping but it doesn't mean that team A is responsible for this and team B is responsible for that and we have to make sure we allocate well. We can smooth that out and teams can start leaning in and helping each other, creating the ingestions and transformations. But let's not think about organizational yeah. constructs. And, and, and Andrew, I think in a lot of ways, well, a lot of the principles that you apply to a microservices architecture, you kind of take the same approach here. So if, like with any monolithic system, you'll decompose it. And when you decompose it, maybe you went to coarse grain and you realize you gotta, you have an actual service that's owned by a team and you realize you have to decompose it into to smaller pieces. Using the same concept as a microservices architecture, that's at that point where you may decide decomposing it into smaller subsets, the, the one team can still own it. Or you may decide when you decompose it, hey, this may be too much for one team. And then now you actually have to assemble another team to actually own that particular product, right? And vice versa, right? If you have too, if you have too many and you have to actually pull some of those together, how you then have to then restructure your agile team. So remember, this is really structuring your development teams as agile teams around these products is, is a very important piece to this. You don't wanna keep your own old operating model, water file model, and try to implement this data as products. This is also shifting your organization to more of an agile, lean, aligning teams to products. So then it gives you that flexibility when you need to either make it more coarse or more fine grained, you can then adjust the teams accordingly to be able to, to, to evolve. Cause this, we, me and Sarita made up our mind as we keep saying, we're, we keep, we always remind ourselves, this is not academic, this is not academic. Let's get something going. We're going to learn by doing and we will evolve and it's okay. It is okay. And that's what we keep reminding the teams over and over again, or you're just going to be stuck in analysis paralysis, trying to get this thing um, perfect. But getting a few business wins under our belts is, is definitely a great thing. Learning and evolving is definitely okay, but producing and delivering to the business some early wins gets that collateral under our belts to be able to continue to learn and grow. But we can't, we can't iterate for too long without the business results starting to be realized, or we run out of uh, maybe steam or patience from our sponsor. And somebody just asked about, is, are you using team topologies as well for that? Is, is that the approach that you're using for kind of your organization or, or not? When, um, so I'm not familiar with it. I think I know what it is, but when team topologies, what are you referring to? You mean reference to how we're organizing our teams or? Yeah, it's, it's a it's a specific book and a specific like. Yeah, okay. uh, I, thought it was, I haven't read that book. Um, I know there's a website out there that talks about team topologies as well, anti-patterns, um, more from a dev DevOps perspective, but I haven't read the team to topologies book. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's just, it's basic agile and lean. Yeah, um, team, team topologies is picking up a lot of steam around data mesh just because it, it, okay. it aligns with a lot of the principles of kind of what okay. you're talking about of, of you know, kind of GSD, like get stuff done. Okay. Of uh, of Got okay, it. we're gonna we're gonna put well, this on a team that's enabling these other teams, gotcha. and that they're then going to move on to enabling gotcha. another team and another gotcha. team and another team. It's just, it's just it's so interesting because I'm pretty sure you know in the 25 plus years, 27 years I've been doing, there's nothing new under the sun. 
Um, and I know new books come out, new way of saying things, but just hearing what you're saying, you know, basically we're applying the typical principles around agile and lean and how you think about agility and how you formulate those teams so you can reduce as much friction as possible, right? Follow an agile manifesto as small as possible, focused, um, and then learn by doing, and then you can adjust as you go. So I haven't read the book. Now something I'll go, I, I have intellectual curiosity. So now that's on my list to go see what this book is all about, but we're, we're following the basic principles around Agile and Lean to, to organize our team. I'll get them specifically to send you, you, you three books. If, if okay, you awesome. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, even Data Mesh, I wouldn't say is, is new. I think putting it all together yeah, in the same great. framework is new, but none of the, the pillars themselves are new, right? Absolutely. It's just like, hey, there's this framework that where you've got to really think about these different aspects of it. And once you do that, then you really start to unlock that value. So. No, agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, by the way, at the risk of telling my age, so I've been in this industry for 20, 26 year now, I think. So the distributed databases is the, is the one when I used to be in, in the first time in my career, that was a buzzword, I think. So the, the, the difference was that you still have to go bridges to other databases to get stuff from there and it put into one place. Now, data mess is saying that, no, you don't do that. You just go to the appropriate location where the data is stored and that you don't copy over. In fact, that's the thing. So likewise, the concepts are probably the same, but they have been really changed and maybe refined over time to do that way. So it's, it's nothing nothing new really. Yeah. Um, I. I... You know, I've got one question for, for Sarita that she, she had talked a little bit about definitions and sometimes that falls under governance where there's a global definition or you're talking about glossary and that it might be different between different domains, subdomains, like all of that stuff. Like how, how do you help people to not get, you know, especially when you talk about, uh, you know, Jared mentioned 6,000 apps. So if you think about, you know, even if you have, you know, each, every five app produces one data product, you're going to have 1200 data products, right? Yeah. Like, how do you not block people from innovating, but that you also make it so that people can know what, what the heck is in this and like, what's the discoverability of like, what is actually here? So we're very specific and precise when it comes to confidentiality of data, personal information tagging, knowing which country has jurisdiction over the data. Things that we can say are definitive, yes or no statements based on a prescribed list of rules. So we're very definitive on that. As JR mentioned, we either ask it up front or if we can, we ask it retrospectively after the data has been ingested to make sure that the protection that we have to have on the data is there. And that is basically non-negotiable. Then we talk about more of the subjective descriptions of the data. And then we can talk for days and hours and months and years, and, and it can go on and on. But what we try to do is come up with words that are simple and meaningful and resonate with business people in the industry, whether they're in JP Morgan or outside JP Morgan. A trade is a trade. We can't dispute that. And we try to make those as simple and high level as possible to start. And we have a conversation with the team that's trying to create the product and ask them to describe in layman's terms the content of that data set and ask them to pick from at least the known set of products that we've already come across through the other workloads that we've already been through. And only if they can really convince us that they are special and unique and distinct, we give them a new name, right? We say, okay, you can have another product. <laughs> but we're hoping there's maybe a hundred products in the bank. We're not talking thousands of products. They're really high level constructs. It is all the instrument data in the firm, all the market data in the firm, all the workforce data in the firm. Those hopefully are not as debatable. When we get into sub products, we try not to get too prescriptive. You can put what you're saying, you're putting, use your words, use your language and dialect, work with the product owner, 
and accept that subproduct name. And let's not try to make that perfection. And if another subproduct com comes along later and says, hey, I'm going to use the same word as you, and I really mean something else, well, okay, we'll edit that subproduct, both of those subproducts, and make them more precise. And that's how we evolve. Yeah, I, I've been thinking as well as people are getting going. I, I've seen a couple of people talk about this. It can get you in a lot of trouble, but it's it's also like if you have intentionality around it of just like subdomain underscore that word, right? <laughs> and so it's just like this is my this is clearly a different definition, and it so you don't have to come up with well customer for marketing means customer at any point versus customer for this means current customer and yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, you could imagine the debates we had on the word transaction, for example. Space. <laughs> yeah, I, I worked have to at give a, up at some point, you know, and say it is what it is. Pick the word, move on, come back when there's a real tangible conflicting example, and then and then fix. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, so and, and on the uh, governance side as well, you. Do you have like super specific specifications? It, th this just kind of tr triggered something for me when Intuit was talking, you know, kind of Sarita, what you, you said of, of, you know, at, at this point you have to meet this bar before we'll call you special. Um, Intuit kind of had that same thing for their uh, uh, event specification where they said, we have a firm wide event specification. If you want to use a different event spec, you know, for how you're going to store your events, because you know they wanted to have one spec for harmonization. If you go different, that's fine, but you own it. You're going to define it. You're going to do like all of this work around it. And then if it becomes popular, we're going to pull it into the central thing so you don't have to own that anymore. So great work. We're going to, you know, give you some pats on the back or, you know, some other thing of, you know, maybe you get a bump in your budget or whatever. But until that point, you own it because it's, you know, we're not going to deal with the work of, of 30 different specs to try and do that harmonization. Like, is there a balance that you've found or that you're striking or is it still so early that it's kind of... <laughs> well, we've been here and I I'm not going to disclose my age, but we've been here a long time, right? We know, we kind of know what the boundary contexts are, the financial services institution. We've, we've been down these roads. Now, with alternative data, maybe that gets interesting because that's not content that we've been across in our many years at a financial institution. Fine, we can debate those. But the other ones, we're kind of sort of there. Um, we won't be demanding, but we'll guide and, and advise the teams on a, a product that's pretty good for their needs. So I think that's a, a great answer. Um, so, you know, we're coming up on, uh, we've, we've had you for 90 minutes. Again, if you want to keep going, let's keep going. But I also want to give you an out so that you can, you can take yeah, your I'm, dinners and things like that. I'm ready to eat dinner, Scott. Yes. So um, I think this, I think Sarita ended it very well with the answer that she provided. But um, this has been an awesome experience. I enjoyed the, the format and just you giving us the opportunity to be able to come and and share with this data mesh um, meetup. It's been awesome, Scott. Yeah, well, thank you all for, for taking the time. And, and you know, um, we're, I look forward to working with you further on this stuff, helping you tell your story, because I think it's it's awesome what you're doing and being open and, and talking about this stuff as well. So. Well, hopefully as we go on this journey, I think, you know, it's evolution. And as, as you, we've talked about, we're learning. So maybe it'll be another time we can come back and share a little bit more about how, how we've evolved um, and give you a little bit more meat on the bones in reference to what we've done and some of the mistakes we've made um, on, on this journey. Uh, or, or what we learned from it or how, <laughs> how we exactly. reposition. How we evolved. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would love to have that pretty much as long as I don't have one scheduled at any point. Uh, you know, if I don't have somebody already scheduled for that week, at any point you want to drop in, happy to have you. So, okay. Uh, awesome. Again, th thank you all so much. Um, and